For 40 years, one shiny sticker defined the world of computing. Intel's x86 was the undisputed standard, a guarantee of compute inside nearly every personal computer and server on the planet. But fast forward to today, look inside the devices that define our world. The brain of your iPhone? It's not Intel. The engine of the AI revolution? It's not Intel. The heart of Apple's latest MacBooks? Not Intel. So how did the most dominant architecture in history become a ghost in the machine? Here's the real story. Intel wasn't defeated by a single brilliant rival. The common narrative that it was outmaneuvered by AMD or out-innovated by NVIDIA misses the bigger picture. The truth is a lesson in corporate hubris. Intel's greatest enemy was itself. Its 40-year empire was not conquered from the outside. It was hollowed out from within by a series of catastrophic, self-inflicted wounds, a decade of strategic arrogance, missed opportunities, and a fatal inability to adapt. This is the story of how a company blinded by its own success willingly surrendered the future. To understand this story, we need to deconstruct the four great architectural movements that Intel mishandled, the mobile insurgency it ignored, the AI uprising it dismissed, the fragmentation of the data center it enabled, and the civil war in its own boardroom that has left it paralyzed. Let's unpack this. To understand the decline of Intel, you first have to understand the height of its power. For nearly four decades, the company's dominance wasn't just a market position, it was a self-reinforcing loop of power, built on a business model no one else could replicate. The first pillar of this empire was the Wintel monopoly, a strategic alliance with Microsoft that fused Intel's x86 hardware with the Windows operating system. This created a powerful lock-in. Software developers wrote for Windows, which meant they were writing for Intel. This vast software library made the PC indispensable, reinforcing the cycle. By 2005, the empire's gravity was so immense, it forced the ultimate surrender. Apple, Intel's longtime rival, abandoned its own power PC chips and put Intel inside its Macintosh computers. We announced that by June of this year, June of 06, we would be shipping Macs with Intel processors. But this market dominance was only possible because of the second, more powerful pillar, Intel's manufacturing fortress. For decades, Intel was an integrated device manufacturer, or IDM. This meant it didn't just design the world's best chips, it built them in its own world-leading factories. This wasn't just a supply chain choice, it was a weapon. It created a virtuous cycle. The world's best designs were manufactured on the world's most advanced process, creating a chip with the performance edge no competitor could match. The massive profits from selling that chip were then funneled back into building the next generation of even more advanced factories. This synergy was the engine of Moore's law. Intel didn't just follow the law that the number of transistors on a chip doubles every two years. For a generation, Intel was the law. While AMD struggled to keep pace, Intel's integrated model allowed it to dictate the rhythm of the entire industry. Finally, Intel translated this technical supremacy into the third pillar, cultural dominance. The Intel Inside campaign was in many ways a cultural phenomenon, transforming the microprocessor from an invisible component into a trusted household brand. A locked-in software ecosystem, a self-funding manufacturing fortress, and a brand that was synonymous with computing itself. The x86 empire wasn't just dominant, it felt permanent. 
By the way, deconstructing these kinds of business moats and identifying the hidden vulnerabilities within them is the core of our analysis in the ARPU newsletter. If you want to get this level of strategic insight regularly, you'll find the link right at the top of the description. But Intel had a fatal blind spot. Its entire strategy was optimized for the high margin world of PCs and servers. It was a strategy for a world of desktops and data centers, not a world of pockets and palms. The first crack in the empire came from an entirely different architectural philosophy, ARM. Unlike Intel's x86, which was built for maximum performance, the ARM architecture was built for maximum efficiency. It was a blueprint for low power chips designed for a new generation of battery powered devices. This architectural mismatch led to a catastrophic business miscalculation. When Apple approached Intel in 2007 to build the processor for its first iPhone, then CEO Paul Ottolini famously turned them down. He saw a low volume, low margin project that didn't fit Intel's business model. He reportedly believed that it was a deal where Intel did not stand to profit enough. What he failed to see was the dawn of a new computing paradigm. Apple, rebuffed by Intel, turned to the ARM architecture and began designing its own A-series chips, manufactured by Samsung and later TSMC. This move didn't just create a new rival, it unleashed a new business model. ARM's flexible licensing strategy allowed hundreds of companies, from Apple to Qualcomm, to design their own specialized, efficient chips for the exploding smartphone market. By the time Intel realized its mistake, the mobile insurgency was a full-blown revolution. ARM had become the undisputed architecture of the mobile era, a market Intel had completely missed. Its low power technology now powers over 99% of the world's smartphones. But this total victory in mobile was just the beachhead for a wider invasion. By the first quarter of 2025, according to industry data, ARM was not just winning in mobile, it was taking ground on Intel's home turf. Its share of the total processor market had surged to nearly 14%, while Intel's share collapsed to 65%, a two-decade low. The empire of x86, for the first time, had been proven vulnerable. It had lost a war not because its technology was inferior, but because its strategy was inflexible. And this first defeat was a warning shot for an even greater battle to come, the war for the soul of the data center. As the world entered the 2020s, a new insatiable demand emerged, the need for massive parallel computing to power the AI revolution. This was a workload for which Intel's sequential processing CPUs were fundamentally the wrong tool. The right tool was the graphics processing unit, or GPU. And one company, NVIDIA, had spent two decades preparing for this moment. Intel's second great strategic failure was its inability to recognize this paradigm shift. The company made only half-hearted attempts to build competitive GPUs, and even declined an early opportunity to invest in open AI in 2017. Its primary effort to enter the market, the $2 billion acquisition of Habana Labs, proved to be a failure. By late 2024, Intel was forced to admit that its Gaudi processors were going to miss their revenue targets. While Intel was focused on protecting its CPU kingdom, NVIDIA was building a new one. Their masterstroke wasn't just building faster hardware, it was creating the software that would lock the entire AI world into their ecosystem. That software was CUDA. Our GPUs, because of CUDA, is both an acceleration platform for many domains of applications, from image processing to particle physics to quantum. And so our platform is programmable. And also because we had the discipline of ensuring 
our entire install base of GPUs are CUDA compatible. Every new algorithm that is developed on any of our GPUs will run on all of our GPUs. And that gives the developers reach while it gives the new developers the capability to solve problems they couldn't solve before. CUDA became the programming language of AI. It gave developers a powerful, accessible way to harness the parallel power of GPUs. As a result, the entire scaffolding of the AI revolution, from academic research labs to the world's most valuable AI startups, was built on NVIDIA's proprietary platform. For AI developers, using anything else was an exercise in frustration. AMD's competing software was seen as buggy and immature. Intel was a non-entity. The CUDA ecosystem became a giant moat, a barrier to entry that was as formidable as any factory. The financial consequence was a tectonic shift in the industry. As the AI boom ignited, NVIDIA's data center business exploded with its market value soaring into the trillions. NVIDIA now controls an estimated 90% of the market for data center GPUs. Intel, the company that had defined computing for a generation, had now completely missed the two most important technological waves of the 21st century, mobile and AI. The final stage of Intel's decline was the architectural fragmentation of its last remaining stronghold, the data center. For years, the data center was a homogenous environment built on a single monolithic blueprint with the Intel CPU as the universal engine for nearly every task. But the extreme computational demands of AI shattered that model. The modern data center is no longer a single purpose entity. It has evolved into a heterogeneous system of specialized processors, each optimized for a specific function, fundamentally diminishing the centrality of the general purpose CPU. The first and most significant shift was the rise of the AI accelerator. The massively parallel workloads of training and inference required a different kind of processor. This demand created a new multi-hundred billion dollar market dominated by NVIDIA's GPUs and the custom designed ASICs from Google, Amazon, and Microsoft. In this new architecture, the CPU was relegated from the primary compute engine to a secondary host role, managing the system while the accelerators did the heavy lifting. Second, as the scale of AI clusters grew, data traffic became a critical bottleneck. This led to the development of a new class of specialized hardware, data processing units, or DPUs. These processors, championed by companies like NVIDIA and Broadcom, took over the complex tasks of managing network traffic and storage, offloading functions that were previously handled by the CPU. This made the entire system more efficient, but it also carved out another key responsibility that once belonged to Intel's domain. The strategic consequence for Intel is that its total addressable market within the data center has fundamentally changed. While the total capital being invested in data centers is exploding, the percentage of that capital being spent on general purpose CPUs is in structural decline. Intel was left defending its dominance in a segment of the market that was becoming a smaller and smaller fraction of the whole. The universal engine was being replaced by a system of specialists, and the empire built on generalization was being hollowed out from within. The cumulative effect of these architectural wars, the loss of mobile, the rise of AI, and the fragmentation of the data center was a catastrophe for Intel. By 2024, the damage was no longer theoretical. It was written in black and white on the company's balance sheet. After decades of consistent profitability, Intel reported a net loss of $18 billion for the year, its first since 1986. The company's free cash flow, a critical measure of financial health, turned negative in 2022 and has not recovered since. Its manufacturing division, once the fortress that guaranteed its dominance, was now a cash furnace, losing over $7 billion in a single year. 
Meanwhile, its last remaining stronghold, the core x86 server market, was no longer a safe haven. It had become a fiercely contested battlefield, where its rival, AMD, had finally achieved peer status, eclipsing Intel in data center chip revenue. The cumulative weight of these failures became untenable. In November 2024, Intel's board forced CEO Pat Gelsinger to resign. His ambitious comeback plan was over. In his place, they installed Lip Bhutan, a chip industry veteran with a reputation for brutal pragmatism, signaling a definitive end to the era of ambition. The empire, built on the singular power of the x86 architecture, was now a shattered kingdom, and it was left with a profound identity crisis and a new leader tasked not with conquering new worlds, but with salvaging the old one. Just as the iconic company seemed to hit rock bottom, the crisis escalated into the realm of the unprecedented. In August 2025, President Donald Trump took to Truth Social and called for the immediate resignation of Intel's new CEO. The attack was triggered by a letter from Senator Tom Cotton questioning Lip Bu Tan's past venture capital ties to China and his role as a quote-unquote responsible steward of American taxpayer dollars. The government that had tasked Intel with securing America's chip supply was now openly questioning the loyalty of its leader. But the attack from Washington only exposed a deeper internal war. According to a report from the Wall Street Journal, the new CEO was, quote, already at odds with some board members before the president's post. The conflict is over the very soul of the company, Tan wants to save Intel's manufacturing business, arguing it is integral to its success and needed to ensure the U.S. doesn't become reliant on foreign semiconductor companies. But board chairman Frank Yuri reportedly wants to, quote, exit from the foundry business entirely and had previously explored a sale to TSMC. This internal power struggle has left the new CEO strategically paralyzed. The journal reports that the board has stalled a multi-billion dollar capital raise Tan had lined up and took so long deliberating a potential AI acquisition that the target is now poised to be bought by a rival. This is the ultimate crisis. Intel is a company at war on three fronts, with its competitors, with its own government, and now with itself. The very people tasked with saving the empire are locked in a battle over its future. The end of the x86 empire hasn't just left Intel with an identity crisis, it has left it in a state of open warfare with the White House, with its own board, and with itself. The three paths forward are no longer strategic options. They are the battlegrounds for this internal conflict. Can it be a manufacturer like TSMC? Not when its own board chairman is reportedly trying to dismantle the foundry. Can it be an AI designer like NVIDIA? Not when that same board stalls the acquisitions needed to compete. And can it be America's national champion? not when the president himself has declared its leader conflicted and is demanding his resignation. The decisive variable for Intel survival, therefore, is no longer technology or a single strategic choice. It is the capacity for unified action. The company is paralyzed by a three-way power struggle between a CEO who wants to rebuild, a board that wants to dismantle, and a government that now trusts neither. Each faction is pulling the company in a different direction, making a coherent strategy impossible to execute. Before Intel can fight the architectural war against its rivals, it must first end the civil war in its own boardroom, because a company without a unified vision cannot execute a comeback. And right now, Intel's greatest enemy isn't a competitor, it's the chaos within its own walls. Deconstructing these kinds of internal power struggles and connecting them to the wider market is the core of our analysis. 
In our weekly newsletter, ARPU, we move past the headlines to give you the strategic frameworks you need to see the real game being played. If you want to get that kind of insight delivered to your inbox, the link is right at the top of the description. Thanks for watching.